Today we conclude a series on some concepts of popular games, and we come to the only video game that's been represented in this uh, series today. Uh, this is the only game we've used so far that I have not had the pleasure of playing. Um, this game is owned and played by my youngest brother, who reminds anybody who meets us that I am his much older brother. You know how younger siblings are. It's also played by my son, some of my nephews, Adam. How many of the rest of you have played Call of Duty? There's uh, more hands in first service. Um, so uh, you, can, you know what the game's about. I have to tell those folks what the game's about. Uh, it's primarily a first-person shooter computer video game. It was first released in October of 2003. So the game has been around in various forms um, since, uh, since that time. The first games uh, in the series were set in a World War II uh, atmosphere uh, using the weapons and the enemy and all the kind of stuff from, from that era, uh, a time in our history that we greatly respect our veterans who day by day we have fewer and fewer of those who served uh, in World War II. And so we're just uh, thankful for that. But the games have been called Call of Duty, Call of Duty 2, Call of Duty 3, you know how these things go. They continue to, to release something that's a little different, you know, gives people that enjoy the game a, a chance to purchase something a little bit different. Uh, there was a game that called that, call, a game called, in the series came out called Black Ops, which was based in a Cold War era. And pretty much every game since then that have come out under Call of Duty have been... Um, something modern, contemporary, or in the future. Uh, this particular game is Black Ops 2, uh, which is set in the time frame of 2025. So in our future, not too awful far out there, uh, but this game is set in that era. They're still releasing games. There was one announced this spring that will come out in the fall, and so it just continues to come. Um, I was checking online to see how many people have bought this game. When I, the last statistics I saw were from February of this year, and at that time, um, over 139 million copies of Call of Duty have been sold in this world. So it's a popular game. A lot of people enjoy it and uh, spend their time doing it. It's a war game with basically you against the world. Any enemy combatants are popping up all over the place trying to uh, kick you off your mission to destroy you before you take them out. Uh, it's kind of a tough guy game if you want to get into that kind of thing played in your recliner. You know, it's just kind of one of those uh, things that uh, or whatever your comfort spot is for this game, you do that. Um, it's up to you and you alone to conquer. And uh, you just go at it. I was thinking as I was this working on this uh, message um, about how the fact that a lot of you are very hardworking people. As I was thinking through the, the members of this church family and, and people that are still working. I know a lot of you that aren't working say you work harder now, retired, and sometimes you did on your job. So it's not just the people still in a job that are hardworking people. I think a number of you are. And you're out every day facing obstacles and, and, and challenges that just tax you every single day. I mean, it's, it's overcoming problems, it's beating deadlines, it's, it's uh, dealing with people problems, you know. I don't know anybody in a job that works with other people doesn't eventually begin telling me about a people problem. And then there's resource problems, you know, trying to find resources to complete a job. Sometimes there doesn't seem to be enough money or we don't have things when we need them and companies deal with those things. And, and then there's just simply battling the stresses of what your work is. And those pressures that are unique to what you do. And sometimes you feel like the weight of the world is lying on your chest. And you've just got to step up and meet it. Because it's your call of duty. And it might be more than you can tackle on your own. And maybe you've absorbed more responsibility than you really should absorb. And it's become unhealthy for you and the way you face your work. You know, I think all of us go through times when we 
We think we're stronger than we actually are, that we have to be in control. We have to manage this. We have to fix this. We have to, we have to make this work out. We have to worry about it. Somebody has to. And we kind of made this our thing to do. And we're the only ones that can do this particular job. It's our call of duty. And we try to step up to it. I think this kind of mindset can develop into a very unhealthy thing. When we see our role in a relationship or in the workplace as greater than it ought to be, it's going to lead to unhealthy decisions for us and for people affected by our lives. And these types of relationships, when you think of people, should be avoided at all costs. Because these kind of relationships don't honor God. They serve no good. God calls us to a dependence upon Him first of all. Because He alone possesses everything that we need. He holds it all. You know, we pray to, the, to, the, to God each day. The model prayer Jesus said to pray, Our Father who is in heaven. In other words... The God who has all of heaven's resources to meet our needs is who we're praying to. He is the one we need to be dependent upon. Not relationships with other people. They can become too important. Our true worth as individuals is really seen only when we completely trust in our God. God knows us. He knows what we need. He has the resources to take care of us. As we've been looking at this Sermon on the Mount and some various pieces of this opening sermon in the kingdom that that Jesus came to establish and the many things that he said in this message, there's, there's so many things we could say about the Sermon on the Mount. But one of the most amazing things that we see in this was the authority in which Jesus taught. He wasn't just repeating the words of of various prophets and, and various ones who had interpreted the law as the people's rabbis had done up to this point. Jesus was saying, this was said to you, but I say to you, And he took things a step further. He went to the heart of matters because Jesus knew that the heart is where problems begin. Problems for us begin on the inside. How we choose to respond to things and they flow outward. And the things on the inside need to be fixed. Not the external symptoms. The heart needs to be fixed. It needs to be given to the only one who truly will take care of our hearts. The one whose love exceeds the love we would bring to him. You and I are never going to love God as much as he loves us. No matter how devoted we become. We're never going to love him as much as he loves us. He made us. He made us in his image. His son died on the cross for your sins and mine. Is there any greater love than what Jesus has revealed and God has revealed through him? There's a couple things as we think about the Sermon on the Mount and, and, and what it calls us to do from the particular passage that we're looking at today. And we're in Matthew chapter 6. For those of you who brought your Bibles would like to look at that. But the first point on your outline today I want to talk to you about is that we are called to move away from A-frame relationships. To move away from A-frame relationships. Our premarital sessions for couples use the book Saving Our Marriage Saving Your Marriage Before It Starts is put together by Drs. Les and Leslie Parrott. I love their names. But they do such a great, light-hearted, make all the points they need to make, good give and take. They make a lot of great points and that's why we use their material to help prepare people for married life together. And they talk about three types of couple relationships in their book based on three alphabet letters. And those letters are A, H, and M. And they talk about, first of all, an A-frame relationship is a dependent relationship. 
The partners uh, are a, have a strong couple identity, but they have very little individual self-esteem. And they're like the long letters in the letter A. They, they lean on one another. The relationship is fragile, though, because if one falls, they both fall. There is an unhealthy leaning upon the other person to provide for the other. Independent partners desire happiness, but no personal growth. They're not interested in nourishing the relationship, but in simply being nourished by their partner. It's a very selfish relationship, a dependent relationship that is held together by a common bond of selfishness. H-frame relationships are structured like the letter H. The the partners stand virtually alone, each self-sufficient, and neither influenced much by the other. Their lives touch, they're connected in some way, but not in a significant way, other than they live in the same place, they may eat at the same table, they may not. There's a bond, but it's not much of a bond. This is often called a disengaged relationship. The term reflects the isolation and the independence of the spouse's who are attempting to earn a a sense of wholeness by relying on no one. Not even each other. They're very independent, lightly connected, and that's it. The M-frame relationship rests on interdependence. Each partner has high self-esteem and is committed to help the other partner grow. They could stand on their own, but they choose to be together. They're joined. You almost see in the letter M, the couple standing together and they're holding hands in the middle. They could function as independent, but they choose to stand together. Their relationship involves mutual influence, emotional support, and as you can imagine, as you look at these letters and you think about the description that they give, That M is the preferred relationship. That's the healthiest relationship. The first two relationship types are deeply flawed and dangerous. And today I want to talk to you for just a few minutes about the danger of choosing people-dependent relationships rather than a God-dependent relationship. There's a term that's emerged out of the Alcoholic Anonymous movement for this kind of call of duty game. And it's called codependency. Codependency. It's another term for an unhealthy need to be needed. That will cause you to give up your convictions, your values... And your own personality and dreams because you want to be needed. You are so desiring to be needed that you're willing to forfeit the person you are to have this person in your life that makes you feel needed in some way. And it becomes so unhealthy that you lose who you are. Because our addiction to be needed is so strong and a lot of times we don't even know we have it. You know, I think it's easy to look down a list of codependency symptoms and say, I struggle with that. That sounds like me. I never looked at it that way. One characteristic of codependency is this. My worth is determined by what I do and how well I do it. My wealth is determined by how well I, what I do and how well I do it. It's always asking, have I done enough to be okay? Have I done enough to be loved? What are other people thinking about me? What are other people saying about me? Do they think I'm cute, I'm funny, I'm smart? Do I fit in here? Do they approve of me? 
Do they like the way I taught or the way I sang or the way I prayed or the way I wrote or the way I, I pre- made my presentation? Am I okay? Somebody tell me. I'm okay. Oprah Winfrey said that the number one thing that celebrities asked her backstage after she had interviewed him was this. Was I okay? Was I okay? You see, we can be so dependent on the approval of others in general and usually it's somebody significant in our life but we're so addicted to their approval that we continually give up who we are and it becomes a very unhealthy situation. You know, some people on the workaholic treadmill are looking for that elusive attaboy or that sincere great job that never came often enough when they were growing up. They were always trying to please the the parent or the guardian or the teacher or the coach or the boyfriend or the girlfriend. And there was never enough, hey, you did a great job or wow, you're really a special person. There just wasn't enough of that. And you kept giving and giving and giving and there was nothing coming back. And you spend the rest of your life trying to find that, that praise. And sometimes we don't realize how great of a deficiency exists in our souls. Because we just are still looking for that. And there are people on the workaholic treadmill that are working, 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 working just so somebody will value them and tell them that they value them. You know, you see this sometimes in dating relationships. When people are willing to compromise their personal beliefs or their moral values just to fit in with somebody they want to like them or just to please another person just to feel that sense of belonging just to feel accepted and sometimes it breaks my heart to see Christian men young men, Christian women young women that forfeit everything they knew to be right just because they want somebody to accept them. Is it really worth it? It's codependent behavior. And it expresses a deep inner need that isn't met through human relationships, but through godly relationships. When any of us looks to other relationships or to personal achievement or to outstanding performance or to good deeds or anything external to measure our worth as people, we are in bondage as a codependent. And being obsessed with what other people think about you is the quickest way to forget about what God thinks about you. What people think, what God thinks. What's most important to you? It's seen every day in the decisions you make and where your heart and mind is. Another characteristic of codependent behavior is the inability to say no. One guy tweeted, yes, that's me trying to say no. When you can't say no, no matter how much you know you should, You need to ask yourself, why? Why can't I say no? Why when I know I really shouldn't say yes, do I say no? But so often instead of stopping long enough to ask what's going on in us that we're doing this, we just kept going down the same path of insanity. And as a result, it leads to greater levels of stress, which leads to greater levels of irritability, which gives way to even greater explosions of anger and frustration. And we can become a really hard person to live with. Sometimes codependency is seen in a twisted version of the golden rule, which says we start doing for others what they should be doing for themselves. The codependent becomes a self-appointed fixer, the self-appointed primary caretaker of the other person. It's their adopted 
call of duty. If I don't do this for this person, if I don't step in and cover for them, if I don't do this, nobody else will. And I become in bondage to this person, to this relationship. And all I'm doing is covering the other person's habitual irresponsibility. You know, this isn't done in a Christ-like, how can I serve you? This is that addiction to be needed that leads us into an unhealthy relationship where our lives are the covering of another person's problems. You know, many codependents try to protect the other person from the consequences of their behavior, their unhealthy behavior, whether it be drugs or alcohol or laziness or multiple affairs. And they're often unaware that by doing so, they're actually enabling the problem rather than helping the problem. And maybe they are aware of what they're doing, that it's not really helping. But because of their own addiction to be needed, they just can't stop. So a person with an addiction is attached to a person with an addiction. They're two different addictions. But in some unhealthy, sick way, they think they're helping each other. Jesus preached a dependence on God alone. That that relationship, this full trust in Him, will free us from these unhealthy relationships with others. You know, some relationships just need to be walked away from because they're not good for anybody involved. Or people sometimes need to lean into a God that loves you and get some help to place boundaries in your relationship that are good and healthy. Some people need to see a Christian counselor and begin unpacking what's going on in their lives so that they better understand themselves so that they can work toward being involved in more healthier relationships in the future. But Jesus wants us to know, first of all, move away from A-frame relationships. Move away from dependent relationships. The second thing, commit to marinating. Commit to marinating. Bet you didn't expect to see that word in the outline this morning. Throw in food anytime you can. You know, in Matthew 6.25, Jesus begins talking in this very familiar passage about other things besides people that we are going to depend on as human beings. It's going to be a natural thing. Things that we want to control. Things that we want to store away for safekeeping or easy access. Things that we have trouble letting go of. You know, when something in your life becomes so strong that you won't let go of it for anything in this world, not even the call of God, it has become too important to you. It's become your God. And Jesus is saying you have to watch out for that. Jesus says that to be a devoted follower of his is to be freed from the anxiety and worry that so often characterizes the fallen world that we live in. Listen to what he said as he looked into the eyes of people who are listening to this sermon, who are thinking, I'm going to have some trouble living up to these things. And he could see the worry already etching across their faces. And he said at the beginning of verse 25, he said, therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more important than food, and a body more important than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns. And yet, your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Who of you by worrying can add a single hour to his life? And why do you worry about clothes? See how the lilies of the field grow. They do not labor or spin. Yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all his splendor was dressed like one of these. 
If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow, is thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you? Oh, you have little faith. Jesus identifies here three sources of great anxiety for people. He says, first of all, there's a lot of anxiety in the human heart for our lives. Our safety. Our security. You know, often we pray for people going on trips. We pray more about their safety than the accomplishment of their mission. And it's understandable to want people we love to be safe. I pray the same thing. But sometimes within all of us, there is such a desire for safety and security that it can become unhealthy. Our lives, thinking about that, includes our body and our health. Jesus said there's going to be a temptation to worry about your life. He also goes on to say there's, there's going to be worries about food. You know, we love to eat. We had breakfast here this morning. If you got early enough to enjoy it, it's great. But our lives are kind of built around eating. You know, a lot of you skip breakfast in the morning, but a lot of you can't leave the house without it. Even if it's a pop-tart, tart, pop-tart, pop-tart as you run out the door. Pop-tart, I don't know, anyway, anyway. But you know, then there's lunch, you kind of build your life around lunch, and then there's supper, and if you're like a lot of people, there's that snack before you go to bed, maybe that bowl of cereal, whatever it is for you. Some of you get up in the middle of the night, I'm not going to ask who it is, because you just got that gnaw in your stomach, and you just feel like you got to get up and eat something. We're so driven by food, and when the next meal is, and what are we going to have? And the thought of missing a meal is more worrisome to us than we think. Food's important, and it become, can become too important. But Jesus said there's a third thing. Your clothing. Sometimes it's easy to be almost obsessed about what you'll look like. You stand in front of the mirror for a long time and make sure every hair's in place. You didn't cut yourself shaving. Your clothes are looking right. Not too much cat hair on your seat when you get up. You know, am I in style? Do I look like everybody else? Am I going to stand out? I mean, especially when we go to somewhere we've never been before, what are we supposed to wear? I don't want to look different than everybody else. It's so easy to be caught up in our look. And it can, can become, Jesus said, obsessive. It can become a point of worry and anxiety in our lives. And you've got to watch this. And as Christians, I think we need to ask if any of these things has become too important to us. It has become more important. It's become so important that we actually worry about it. We actually get anxious about it. And we don't turn it over to God. We just, we just stew in it. And Jesus went on to say in Matthew 6, 32, For the pagans run after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. I love how twice in this section already, Jesus has looked at his audience and said, Your heavenly Father. Your heavenly Father. Your heavenly Father. Knows what you need. He's your Heavenly Father if you've given your life to Him. This is who's going to take care of you. Not somebody else's Father, but yours. He hasn't forgotten what you need. He hasn't lost you among the billions of people that populate this planet. In God's kingdom, we have a Father who cares for us. And if he has given such attention to impersonal things like birds and grass, will he not meet the needs of his own people? Jesus says, as members of God's kingdom on earth, we are to, Matthew 6, seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. And all these things will be given to you as well. Jesus says your life, if you don't want to worry, if you want to escape the bondage of worry and codependency on items in your life, 
in things that cause you anxiety. If you don't want to live that way, seek the thing, seek God first. Seek the things that are of value and gain for his kingdom. Because after all, he cares for you. He provides for you. He's your father. He loves you. He created you with a deep spiritual need for a relationship. In him, you, we will finally see our great value that he's given to all of us, made in his image, and security that comes only from being his child. We don't have to perform to earn his love. We don't have to pretend. We don't have to fix. We don't have to control or worry. We just need to be dependent on him first of all. And let's get to the marinating. You know, food on the grill is best when it's had time to marinate. Now, some of you are grill masters. Anybody here a grill master? I know you are. I know some of you, Mark talked about it last week, learn from the best, Steve, Brandon. I see you're waving hands at him. Was that your hand? Cool. All right. Bite me over. <clears throat> anyway, you have. Um, food on the grill is best when you marinate. Maybe you buy it, you know, you go to the store and you know that formula you like to marinate in. Maybe it's something already made up or maybe one of those really creative people and you want to make your own from scratch in. And you know the importance of those several hours of that overnight marination of meat because that, when you put it on the grill and it starts cooking and you finally put it in your mouth, it's just one of the greatest things on this earth. It's the best because it's marinated. The taste is inside the meat. But there's also great gain when we soak in the truth of God's love. When we seek him first and let the truth of his love and acceptance just saturate our lives to the very core, to the heart, to our soul. Because it'll change everything about you. You know, over 40 times in the Bible, the term unfailing love is, is used. And every single time it's used, it's always connected to the only one who can actually give you that. The only one. I'll give you a few examples. Psalm 32 10. Many of the woes of the wicked, many are the woes of the wicked, but the Lord's unfailing love surrounds the man who trusts in him. Psalm 33 5. The Lord loves righteousness and justice. The earth is full. Of his unfailing love. Psalm 137. O Israel hope in the Lord. For with the Lord there is unfailing love. His redemption overflows. If you want to really do something cool. If you want to understand this God who loves you better. Get out of concordance. Find unfailing love. And start going through the passages and just marinate in the love of God for you. And all of a sudden you'll realize the more you let that soak in, that you really don't need unhealthy attachments to people or things. You just really need Him because He has given you great value. He loves you more than anyone else. Let's pray. Father, we are so humbled by your love for us. Because we know we're not always lovable, lovely people. And Father, sometimes we feel like we we have to earn your love or we have to be worthy of it or when we do something wrong you've turned your back on us and you're really scolding us and we can't look you in your face again and we have accepted a, a world's view of a God that is so distant not even close to what you are and we learn about you in the Bible
the love that sent Jesus here and had him down the cross for our sins is the greatest display of love there could ever be. And that was for us as individuals. For every person in this world that would receive it. But so many people, and ourselves included, are so busy chasing satisfaction and fulfillment and things that are far less than what you offer us. And our lives become erasing for empty things and empty relationships instead of turning to you and finding freedom from our bondage of codependency. Oh Lord, may we come to you for, to free us May we come and lay our lives at your feet and say, be Lord in my life. Father, help me to know you better. And begin marinating in your word and your truth. And letting you free us from things that have held us in bondage too long. Father, we can't chase the things the world chases. Because you're not at the end of those things find you when we look to you in the scriptures and let you be God in our lives. Oh, we ask for that today in Jesus' name. Amen. There's no one who completely fulfilled all the ethical commands of the New Testament, the Sermon on the Mount, except Jesus. And there's no greater thing that we can do than not just agree with him but accept the one as our Lord. Who actually fulfilled what he taught. And we need to accept him. That's the greatest thing we can give him in response. And I pray that you do that today. If you've never given your life to Jesus, the baptistry history is ready. You simply need to come and state your belief in him. Come confessing your sin, not to us as a group, but in your heart to God. Being willing to turn from the things in your life that you know are not what he wants. And then to be immersed in a watery grave that's called baptism in the New Testament. If you've already done that and you're looking for a church home, a church family, a group of people to help you grow in your walk with God, we'd love to be that family for you. To seek his kingdom and his righteousness is is our, our goal. Fulfill the great commission that he's given us is, is, our, is our purpose. Come do that with us. Whatever your decision is, I'll be down front to greet you if it's a public one. Would you come as we stand together as we worship?